Hello everyone, welcome to the Melting Pot Podcast. I'm your host, Dominic Monkhouse. The Melting Pot is as a result of my hunger for optimizing business performance, scaling up organizations, corporate culture, customer addiction, building high-performing teams, along with a few other obsessions along the way. I've spent the last several years working for and with some of the most successful top performing companies in the world. And this podcast is my attempt to synthesize what I've learned along the way to help you build a high quality business and live a more fulfilling life. If you enjoy the podcast, you can find more information on today's episode and other topics at dominicmonkhouse.com. Hi, and welcome to The Melting Pot. Today, I am talking to Mark Lewis. Mark Lewis is the founder and principal, maybe the Dumbledore for the 21st century. He started or restarted the School of Communication Arts and every year choreographs an amazing curriculum for his 35 students who go through his program and then get jobs in advertising in the UK. I was lost for words today talking to Mark. Normally these conversations are somewhere between half an hour and 45 minutes. And before I knew where we were, we were approaching the hour. So this is a longer episode than usual. We talk about Mark becoming, buying his first Ferrari in his early twenties, making millions out of porn, giving it all up when he realized he had a child and wanted to live a better life and how he went on to his dot-com boom success. And then he decided to give back and restart a school that he had been the last pupil of. And what an amazing story, just absolutely incredible. It's a whirlwind tour through the School of Communication Arts, its history, its present day, what the thousand mentors do, what the curriculum looks like, and the life and times of Mark Lewis. Enjoy. My name is Mark Lewis, and I am the Dean and founder of School of Communication Arts (laughs) 2.0. And what is the School of Communication Arts? The school is currently the world's most eminent portfolio school, and I would describe that by number of portfolios that make it into cream each year, or Black Pencils one at DNAD, or probably more importantly, jobs gained by students going into the ad industry. We're a social enterprise about to become a charity. We take 36 students each year through a 12-month journey in my studio, followed by six months of placements. One in three of those students receive a scholarship, some receive bursaries. And we have a network of about a 1,000 teacher mentors who help me write the curriculum and deliver the learning experience. So SCA 2.0 is a kind of an apprenticeship model meets a university model meets, I don't know, a bit of a circus, a bit of a funfair road. (laughs) Why is it 2.0? What was the School of Communication Arts 1.0 and that, that maybe that takes us back in time and takes us some some way on your journey before we dive into the school as it is today. All right, well, so I guess you're alluding to the fact I, I went to the original SCA when it was run by an incredible educator called John Gellard, who founded the SCA after a career in university, where he taught Sir John Hegarty before he was a Sir Graham Fink, before he was as brilliant as he is now. Ah, he was probably always brilliant. Uh, an old bunch of others. And I won a scholarship to the SCA in 1993. And when John opened the school in the 1980s, um, he had just recently discovered that he had Parkinson's disease, which would eventually kill him. I was his last scholarship boy. So I, I attended in 93 and John retired with poor health in 94. And when he retired, the school closed the reason it's called Communication Arts 2.0, I don't know if I've said this on a podcast or publicly before, so I'll give you a teeny weedy exclusive, is when I wanted to reopen the school, I discovered that, that John Gillard had bequeathed SCA to DNAD. And quite right that he did, because DNAD rescued the school in the 1980s when, when John ran out of money. Anthony Simmons Gooding rescued the school and moved SCA into DNAD's offices in 
when it was in Graphite Square. DNAD would not let me open the SCA. They felt that it wasn't the right time, that it would be politically inconvenient because it would offend the universities that were part of the DNAD university network. And so they wouldn't allow me to open SCA. And so I went out and I bought the, or I, I created a company called SCA 2.0, basically as a fuck you to DNAD, <laughs> just to get on with it, just because I thought, well, fuck you, DNAD, we need to reopen this school. And that created a lot of bad blood between DNAD and myself for two or three years. They they just thought, probably quite rightly, that I was a dick and I was doing what I wanted to do without thinking about the consequences. And it was only uh, three or four years later when we had proven our track record, consistently won DNAD pencils, come in top of cream, you know, that sort of thing, that DNAD realised that, that perhaps the, the SCA name was in safe hands uh, and that we should smoke a peace pipe. We did that, uh, I want to say, about three years into the, into the journey of SCA 2.0. And we're now best of friends. When was that? How long have you been running the school? Well, I I took the decision to reopen John School in 2008. I took my first cohort in September 2010. I've just said goodbye to my 10th cohort because in in one year I had two intakes. Uh, So my 11th intake are joining me September 2019. But September 2020 will be our 10th anniversary. Oh, fantastic. Congratulations. Why did you feel compelled to open the school? Because I guess I guess you left the school and you went off. Where did you go after you left school? And after you left the school, right? Well, immediately after leaving the school, I went to Johannesburg. It was ninety four. Mandela was about to get elected. The Rugby World Cup was on, and it just seemed a good time to leave. You know, I grew up in Croydon, so you don't need much of an excuse to to want to leave Croydon. Um, So I went to Johannesburg and I joined an agency. Uh, called Sonnenberg Murphy, Leah Burnett. And I was to become the copywriter to one of their associate creative directors, first job out of school. And clearly, I was not experienced enough to be a writer to an ACD. And also, I was really immature. My ads were just full of penis jokes and all that sort of thing. (laughs) And so I got got fired after three months. And I went to another agency called uh, Network, part of the TBWA. And again, they fired me. And so I I started a little agency in Johannesburg in the maid's hut of my house. So in South Africa, anybody that's approaching middle class or above has domestic staff. And the the dumb thing is for the domestic staff to live in a space that you might ordinarily keep your lawnmower and the rest of your garden tools. That's just the way things seem to have been in South Africa. And I thought that was peculiar. So my my maid lived in one of our spare bedrooms, which my neighbours thought was peculiar. <laughs> uh, and so <laughs> I turned our, our hut into a little office, started a little agency. And my first client was a, an American telecoms company called ILD, International Long Distance. Their thing was they specialised in long distance calls that expats could make. Back in those days, so this is, we're talking 94 it was very expensive to make a long distance call. But the way that you would get around that is you would get an account with a company that had representation in, say, for example, California. You would dial a, a long distance number, get a dialing tone, enter your account number, get a dialing tone, and then call London or call Melbourne or call wherever it is you wanted to call. So that was how how you would get cheaper long distance calls in those days. And my, my client's brief to me was sell more of that. And I discovered that the um, South African government in 1987 banned sex lines. They made it illegal to say five specific words over the telephone exchange, and they banned sex lines. And I discovered that my client's technology was based in Los Angeles, which was the world's headquarters of sex lines. And I discovered a way using uh, call termination, using the exchange of, of call minutes in and out between telcos, to bring sex lines back to South Africa. <laughs> and when I had the idea, I formalised an agreement with ILD that I would get 50% of net. And they agreed. And at the age of 21, I was in the sex business and uh, had, bought my, had bought my first Ferrari on the back of sex. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Brilliant. 
And so then, who caught up with you? Why did that? Why did that go horribly wrong? It didn't go so horribly wrong. I guess at twenty one, I guess I didn't really, and I, it took me a long while to value money. But I, I guess I, I didn't know the value of money, and and I was living a lifestyle where a hundred thousand dollars would go into your account and a hundred thousand dollars would go out of your account, and you would just spend as it came in. You know the the party lifestyle. It's amazing if you if you earn five thousand dollars, you can spend five thousand dollars. If you earn twenty thousand, you can spend twenty thousand. If you earn a hundred, you can spend a hundred. It's just it's just it's just really weird how the more you earn, the more you can spend. It's really weird, and uh, and so the money was coming in, and then suddenly a law was created that made it illegal to advertise sex lines. So the South African government in eighty seven had banned sex lines. I found a loophole using call termination bouncing off mirrors and switches in California. And the South African Telecom couldn't block that because to do so would mean blocking calls going from SA Telecom to AT&T. They couldn't block that. So instead, they passed a law making it illegal to advertise sex lines. And sex lines is kind of an impulse sell, right? So you you smother the, the newspapers with classified ads. Generally, the wife goes shopping or wherever it is that she goes the husband generally is alone at home. I say generally because I want to say about 90% of my calls were were heterosexual male looking for female. There was a, a, a other parts of the market that I can talk about that I discovered that's probably not appropriate for this podcast. <laughs> but what happened was uh, a law was passed making it illegal to advertise those sex lines in the classifieds of newspapers. And because it's an impulse sell, you know, the husband sees that his wife is out shopping or wherever, picks up the newspaper and goes, yeah, I fancy a wank and phones up a number and, and spends about 85 seconds on the phone before before he's spent. Overnight, my revenue stopped. Overnight, we were no longer able to advertise our sex lines, and so we didn't have those impulse sales. And so that sort of $100,000, $200,000 a month of commission that I was earning stopped overnight, but my habits didn't stop overnight. And so I had to come up with a wheeze to get around that, and my wheeze was I started a magazine. So in <laughs> this is probably a very different type of podcast. To I've seen the eminent and intelligent people that, that you've spoken to before. I'm going to be the outlier. <laughs> <laughs> I started a magazine called Whore, W-H-O-R-E, Sex for Sale. And what I did was I went into, well, it's called Houses, and I would pay 50 rand, 100 rand, 150 rand to take a photo and imply that that girl that I was taking a photo of was at the other end of a telephone number from my from my telephone lines. So the magazine, which I sold as a as a, a high cover price, was effectively an advertising platform to advertise my lines. I then discovered uh, that you could buy the territorial rights to adult videos. So again, this is long before YouPorn or RedTube or whatever. Companies in generally in California would spend anything from tens of thousands of dollars to a million plus dollars making a porn film, which they would then sell across the Americas and they would then sell territorial rights around the planet. Sub-Saharan African rights were very cheap. So I could buy the rights to a, a decent quality film. I could then get the stills from that film and put that in my magazine. And I would own the rights to sell that film mail order on VHS or, or later DVD. So what started as a telephone line business became a magazine business and selling territorial rights to film business and then also sex toys, mail order and retail. Two years into that journey, I got a girl pregnant and neither of us knew whether we were going to have a boy or a girl. We didn't have the scans. And to, to be clear, it didn't really matter whether we were going to have a boy or a girl. I was very clear in my mind that I couldn't be in the adult entertainment business and be a father, that I'm very proud of a lot of what my family have done. And, and I wanted my family to be proud of what I had done. And I wasn't prepared to look my daughter or my, it turned out, my son in the eye and say that I sent you to school on the back of whore magazine or dildos or, or whatever. So I sold that business to a guy that owned a, a sort of a security company I sold it for just under £5 million, pounds, and I was 23, I think. I moved in briefly with a girl who had become the mother of my, my first child, and we didn't get on. 
I was immature, she was a nag, and we were just not born to be long-term partners. We're very close friends now. She lives down the road from me in London. I bought them a house nearby, but we were not we were not meant to live together. So I wanted to get out of the house. And so I bought a bar nearby, which I turned into a comedy club, South Africa's first comedy club. And I imported talent from mainly from the UK, but a little bit from Australia and the US. There wasn't a stand-up circuit in South Africa because at that time, almost all comedy was kind of what was called Van der Merwe jokes, kind of racist Englishman, Irishman, Scotsman jokes, except about the English, the Africana and the, the people of colour. So I brought comedians over and I did it for my own uh, entertainment. And eventually I went on stage and became a terrible stand-up and a, and a terrible compare. And I started to steal material online using early software called QuickTime. So back in, I, I want to say this is now, we're now at about 1996, 97. This is pre-YouTube. If you wanted to, to consume audio, you had to download the file before you could listen to it. And you were dialing up at maybe 9600, uh, maybe 14.4, 28.8 if you were lucky. So it would take me maybe an hour, hour and a half to download a bit of Jeff Foxworthy or Dennis Leary or Bill Hicks or, or Bill, <laughs> Bill Cosby or whatever. And I would do that and I would, I would download it and then I would learn it parrot fashion and plagiarise it really badly on stage. And overnight, a piece of technology came out, I want to say in about 96, 97, called Real Audio by a company called Real Network. And it allowed you to stream audio, which meant you could click play and within five or six seconds of buffering, the audio started. And it transformed the way that I was able to steal material. <laughs> and I, I made contact with the, the founder of Real Network, who took a shine to me and told me that I was in the wrong country doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. I should be in, in West Coast, USA. And would I like to come and work for him? And I said, no. And I explained why. And he said, well, then you need to go back to London. And he introduced me to a guy called Paul Ayres, who had just done the, the build-up of Netscape and the IPO of Netscape. So Netscape was the first big European IPO. Paul was hired by Real to, to do the same for Real. So Paul left Netscape and went to Real. And Paul was instructed to help me out and give me what was called a bucket of streams. So in uh, 97, 98, if you wanted to stream concurrently, you had to buy like a server that had a, a license attached to it that allowed a, a preset number of concurrent streams, 500 or 5,000 or, or 50,000, and they were fuck off expensive. You know, it could cost you hundreds of thousands or millions of pounds for that license. Remember, this is long before YouTube. So I was gifted that for free by Real Networks through Paul. And in those days, all video was four by three in format. So the old kind of TV shape. And the IAB had recently standardized banner ads at 46860. I wrote a very small piece of code that changed the codec of what became real video uh, from 4 by 3 to 46860. And some code that plugged into the early ad management platforms, Occipita and Dart and similar. So that when a, a, a client uh, landed on Alta Vista or Lycos or Ask Jeeves or Yahoo or whatever, the Occipital or Dart would go, well, who's arriving at our website? What browser have they got? Explorer, Netscape, whatever. What bandwidth are they using? 28, 56. What plugins do they have on board to determine what sort of banner ad to serve? And if the client had real video, then a video banner would be served. And I was able to patent that. And in doing so, I was able to claim the first video banners. And in doing so, I was able to raise some funding. And about 18 months later, I had sold that business to WPP and Chime PLC for just under 20 million sterling. So that's kind of my journey from, from <laughs> SCA. Long answer to your question and the pawn. A long answer to things went wrong, but it kind of, it, as it always does, doesn't it? It turned out okay in the end. Early internet entrepreneur and multimillionaire. Yeah, I was, I was really lucky. I was part of that first wave of the dot-com cycle. It was a small club, I guess, in those days. I, I remember you'd go, kind of go from conference to conference and, and talk and, and see more or less the same more or less the same faces. And also, a majority of those faces were born more or less the same year that I was born, 73. 
And what's interesting, I think, about that, if there's anything interesting about the fact that I'm 46, is that I was born of an age where uh, the Commodore VIC-20 and the Commodore 64 were just about affordable. So you would learn a little bit of basic at home and you would learn a little bit of basic at school. And you would buy these magazines where you could copy out code to create uh, simple programs or, or simple games. If I was born two or three years earlier, I wouldn't have had that. That I would have been too old for the Commodore VIC-20 or, or 64 or Acorn or whatever. And I would have been too old to learn basic in school. If I was born a few years later, if I was a bit younger, I would have been born into something like the Amiga or the first Apples, which would have had a GUI. Or I would have been at school and been taught uh, to use a, a computer with a GUI and thus wouldn't have learned basic. And so I belong to a very small spectrum of years where writing code was as expected of, of the learner as learning how to conjugate Latin or French or understand consent or whatever. Do you know what I mean? I, I'm very lucky that, well, I'm just very lucky. And so you, there you were, you'd sold this business to WPP. Is that the point where you... Strictly to chime PLC, but yeah. And is that where you said you decide to reopen the school? Not yet. So I, I sold that business in March 2000. And again, that's a bit of luck because a couple of months later, we get the first dot-com crash. I appreciate how lucky, how truly lucky I am. Uh, so I sold that in March 2000 uh, for a, a combination of cash and stock. What I would say, Mark, is there are a number of people who who have had similar luck, but when I speak to them, they tell me that they're geniuses. So it either goes one way or the other. Either people say, I'm lucky. I mean, it's not that you didn't work hard like Gary Player. The more you practice, the luckier you get. But it's there are some people who are deny the fact that luck had anything to do with their good fortune. Well, I, I know I'm lucky. I mean, I, I keep a gratitude journal and, and I can talk about that a bit later if you want me to. I think it's important to, to understand and practice gratitude. And I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful for the privilege I have that I'm a white male, middle class, born in 73, born in London. I appreciate that the cards were stacked in my favour right from the very start. So I'm I'm very grateful for that. I'm very grateful that I won the scholarship at John's school that he saw something in me. I'm very grateful that I realised it was my last chance and I should get everything I could out of that school. I'm very grateful that I had a, a, a friend who was white ANC and I learned a bit about the history of apartheid and that inspired me to want to be in South Africa to witness the first fair elections in, in South Africa, which led me to the job at, at Leah Burnett, which got me fired, which got me into porn, which got me into comedy, which got me, into, you know, it's a series of luck None of it could have been predicted. None of it is down to my genius. I'm very clear about that. But I'm also clear some of it was down to my courage, that I was prepared to jump onto a plane or that I was prepared to, to take a risk and do something like porn. I'm not saying, you know, I went into a casino and threw a double six and a double six and a double six and it was purely some, some sort of existential fate. You do make your own luck to a great extent, but I also do, I do get... It, you know, just how very, very lucky I am, how lucky I have been, and how lucky I seem to continue to be. I'm just, I just feel very, very blessed to to be allowed to live the kind of life that I live. It's the seeing the opportunity and taking it, isn't it? Yeah, I wrote a really shit book in, in 2000 when I saw my first dot com. And one of the lines that I wrote was that you can see either opportunity is nowhere or opportunity is now here. And, you know, some people will see those words, opportunity is nowhere. Uh, and other people will see the words, opportunity is now here. And it's just an optical illusion. You can decide how you want to see the world. Opportunity is nowhere. Opportunity is now here. Exactly the same letters in exactly the same order. It's just a matter of perspective. And, you know, I, I just think it's really important to see as much as possible when the glass is, is half full or more. I couldn't agree more. I think, I, in fact, one of the things I do when I'm interviewing is I ask people how lucky they are because that's the, it gives you an insight into their perception of opportunity, but also it's been shown that people who believe they're lucky are more resilient. They don't go around blaming the world for things that go wrong. They just sort of shrug their shoulders and get on. Well, that's where gratitude journals come in. So a lot has been spoken about in recent years, I suppose, about mindfulness and I'm, I'm very lucky, again, I, I've got an incredible wife who is a, a, a very famous psychologist. 
And so she's been able to influence me a lot and, and help me read well. And together we discovered the powers of gratitude. And so we both keep, not all the time, but a lot of the time, and certainly when it's needed, gratitude journals where we wake up in the morning and we think about and maybe even talk about three things that we're grateful for from the day before. And in an analog time, I would have written that into my journal. I now have it as an app called Gratitude Garden, uh, where I type it into my gratitude journal. And that act of thinking about things that you are truly grateful for, the small things, right? So not the the big uh, things. I'm grateful that I'm healthy. I'm grateful to be you know, living through uh, such safe times or not those things. But but for example, I'm grateful that the bus arrived a minute after I got to the bus stop. Or do you know what I mean? Those small things, as, as silly as they sound, recognising them and acknowledging them and then writing them down. And it's the writing the down bit rewires your mind. It literally sets up new channels in the way that you translate the world around you that you start looking for sunlight instead of looking for the darkness you start looking for light instead of heat so that act of of gratitude is proven there are so many white papers and, and research papers written around the cognitive benefits the, the the health benefits of of practicing gratitude that it's now become a compulsory part of my curriculum at school that i expect my students to keep a gratitude journal through their time at school they all get bought a beautiful gratitude journal as a christmas present um, a third of the way through the year, so reset their habits and, and allow them to to put their gratitude into a into a, a more you know something they feel proud of, if you like. I absolutely know with with every every cell in my body that the practice of gratitude is linked to, to having a healthy outlook on life, and having a healthy outlook on life will lead us to an opportunity is now here approach, and that will then allow us to take steps forwards and, and grasp opportunities as we're taking those steps forwards. Yeah, and just make you feel grounded in now and less worried about the future because those opportunities come along and if you're open to the opportunity, you'll take it. Sure. Yeah, so go on, then you, where, where, where we go back to the timeline. So you've sold a business, dot-com crash. Well, I sold that first dot-com in, in March 2000. I got approached by Capstone Wiley to write books. So I wrote a really bad book and I went on the speaker circuit and I was thinking about where to innovate next. And I chatted to a, a mate who was running a business at Unilever. And one of the things that John had taught me at the SCA was this thing called mess finding. So mess finding is is where you look for shit in people's lives. So what, what keeps you up at night? So you might start that by using the phrase, wouldn't it be great if, or I wish that, or what I'd really like to see is. And everyone's got shit in their lives, right? And and mostly, most creative agencies don't ask the CEO or COO, what's the shit in your life? Instead, they're thinking about how they're going to increase sales by 3% or, or how they can increase profit by, or whatever. But I find a really good question to ask people is, like, what's the shit in your life? And so I asked, I'm swearing a lot in your podcast. I'm really sorry. You're going to have to bleep this out. <laughs> No, we're fine. I don't think we've got many listeners in the uh, preschool. <laughs> Leave category. it that. I don't think we've got many listeners on this particular <laughs> issue. Um, so I, I asked, uh, <laughs> it's only Mark. I asked this guy at Unilever who was a senior marketer, what's keeping you up at night? And what he said to me was, what's keeping me up at night is coupon fraud, mal and mis redemption. He said that he was buying 4.7 billion coupons a year in the UK and that the vast majority of those that were redeemed were wrongly redeemed with an average face value of 50 pence. Uh, he was basically printing money and gifting it to Procter & Gamble or Coke or Pepsi or Mars or Cadbury. That was what was keeping him up at night. And when I heard that, I created a portfolio uh, a portfolio of IP that triangulated data between point-of-sale systems, a database, and unique user ID on a mobile device. So that Don could approach a point-of-sale system, which is basically just a PC with a barcode reader. You would uh, display your unique ID to that point-of-sale. The point-of-sale would go, ah, it's Don. Let me look up what rules and actions are relevant for this transaction at this location at this time and date. And it would pull those rules, those if-thens, to that database 
such that, for example, if the rule said, if this user arrives at this lane or this grocer at this time and date and has these sets SKUs in their basket, then give X free or give discount or add loyalty points or whatever. And in doing so, I created quite a valuable body of, of, of IP. I raised some money and, and I proved the concept. I then discovered that uh, the ITV network had a transmitter that transmitted exclusively in, in the city of Hull. And why that's interesting is Hull at the time had its own internet network and obviously its own telephone exchange, Kingston Telecom. And so I was able to conduct a trial in very local, what became Sainsbury local stores. Jackson stores became Sainsbury local stores, proving that, that we could influence basket size, frequency of visit to Sainsbury's local shoppers. And so I, I started to create this quite valuable body of technology and raise some money. And I really wanted to sell this portfolio of IP to Motorola and Motorola Ventures. And they really wanted to buy this IP off me. It was just like a marriage made in heaven. We're now talking 2000 and late 2007, early 2008. They had at the time one of the sexiest mobile phone devices. They had the Razer, which so pre-iPhone, it was just like a very sexy. I don't know if you remember the, the Razer phone, really sexy, which came out of a really creative lab in Schaumburg, just outside Chicago, where just it seemed all the smartest engineers were. Uh, and they had just bought a company called Symbol, who were the leaders in, in barcode reading technology. And I just really wanted to do that sale. And so I, I made sure that I got a good term sheet of Motorola. My shareholders, I had lost control of that company. I no longer had 51%. My shareholders felt that the term sheet was too low and it was too early to sell that we could grow another zero. They sent me to uh, the East Coast and the West Coast to meet some, some American VCs. They were a Swedish high net worth family and they wanted me to, to meet some players from the East Coast and the West Coast of the uh, US VC community. And I met them and I think I can say it now because it's 10 years on and, and water under the bridge. I kind of sabotaged those visits. I didn't want VC money. I wanted to work for Motorola. I really felt that that was my home. I love the people. I quite fancied the idea of living in Chicago for a few years. I just wanted to, to do that deal. So I didn't get a term sheet from any US VC, but I did have my Motorola and Motorola Ventures term sheet. The Swedes asked me to improve that term sheet. I got an improved term sheet slightly. And the Swedes at 11 o'clock decided to say no. And they turned down the, the Motorola deal. And I just lost my shit. I realised that I had no control. And I realised that, therefore, I wasn't in charge of where my next foot would go. My ego found it difficult to, to deal with that. And I had just a spectacular breakdown. I had one of those, you know, one of those moments where you you kind of you don't sleep and you don't eat and it feels like your your skin feels numb and I lost a lot of weight and I'm really again I'm very very grateful my wife's family had a farm they gave it up about three or four years ago but they had a farm in Woburn and I went to the farm to have my breakdown where um, there was no internet and there was no cell phone signal and there was none of the the sort of the flash stuff that was always around me and my wife being the daughter of a farming family just could not give a shit about the money she was not at all impressed by the the fleet of cars that I had or the penthouse that I had built or or any of that nonsense she kind of wanted the opposite of that she wanted you know to enjoy country walks and peace so um I came out the other end of that breakdown I kind of feel that that when you when you have a very well managed breakdown you get the chance to build yourself back up again afterwards in the right order in the way that things are meant to be and what I appreciated about my time running each of my dot coms was what I was very very good at was not the running of the business I mean none of those businesses ever turned to profit what I was very very good at was finding kids out of college or university and giving them their first jobs as engineers or as account managers or as whatever, and then giving them the freedom to grow. So I was a talent spotter. So my purpose was to find and nurture talents. That's what I 
what I did at uh, the video banner business and that's what I did at the what's called embargo the, the mobile ID business and so what I, I realized was I would be able to do something I always said that I'd like to do in my 50s or 60s and that's reopen John's school but instead of waiting until I'm in my 50s or 60s I could do it in my 30s and so um, I think I was 35 yeah I was 35 when I took the decision to reopen John's school and I, I just realized with with Rachel's help that that was my calling there's a beautiful Greek word called telos telos just means purpose and everybody or everything has telos the telos of a of a knife is to cut we all have telos very few of us discover our telos and even fewer of us are then able to apply our telos in our day-to-day lives but my telos my purpose is to find and nurture and once I had realized that and then given the opportunity to apply that in my day-to-day I become unstoppable because I am doing what I was born to do and if a purpose of a knife is to cut if you ask that knife to cut every day it's going to do the best job it can every day and nothing is going to do that job of cutting better than a knife Uh, and so what led me to opening the school was that crazy journey. But that crazy journey, the final destination, I I can now say at the age of 46, I have reached my final destination because I have discovered my telos. Now, how I express that telos day to day will evolve over the years. There's no doubt about that, that that how I teach and who I teach and where I teach and, and even perhaps why I teach may change over the next 5, 10, 30 years. But the telos, the, the purpose for me drawing breath, well, I've discovered that now, and that's my superpower. Oh, that's fantastic. And now you're nine years into that. I guess you keep score in terms of the impact that you have had. What are, what are some of the, I don't know, the scores or the highlights? Or maybe even, because, maybe even, again, I know what the school is. Maybe I don't, I don't know that we said quite what the school does now why it exists so i guess it exists to to widen participation promote diversity whilst improving the excellence of creative education so fundamental belief that that britain as a plc is stronger when it plays the creativity card that we have a proud history of being a very creative community culture nation that creative education dropped after the the demolition of polytechnics in the 1980s and apprenticeships, that the best place to learn uh, creativity is not in a university where the main question is how. The best place to learn creativity is in places that let you ask why. So, you know, we can track the quality or the decline in the quality of British advertising around the time of the decline of the polytechnic and the apprenticeship. So if we think about the golden age of advertising, perhaps being the 1960s or the 1980s, and then the destruction of of those learning temples, and there are now 124 courses in universities teaching advertising, and just how poor the students are coming out of those courses. So it was always going to be very easy for me to open a, a school that was going to deliver a better quality of output than the universities, because we're not a university, because we can go back to getting students to think about the more interesting question, which is why, rather than the secondary question, which is how. The exact opposite of what a three-year university course wants you wants a student to spend its time thinking. And then on that subject, we don't need to do it in three years. We can do it in one year, which makes it feel more like the real wide world. Because in the real wide world, these days, you might only have a day or a couple of weeks to crack a campaign. Whereas in a university, you might have an entire semester or longer. We can do what learning is meant to do. The learning should be action in rehearsal, or at least vocational learning should be action in rehearsal. It should be preparing minds to solve tomorrow's problems and fight tomorrow's wars by playing out those battles, by by trying to work out what weapons are going to be used in those battles in the safe setting of 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 a school that looks like a battlefield. So that's what SCA is, and the way that we teach is is unusual. I can talk about that a bit later if you if you want me to ask me to. 
go on then. What are we, go on, do it. Yeah, do, we'll do that now. As you mentioned, how do you? What's your difference? What's the difference in teaching? Most teaching is horrible jargon coming up. Most teaching is what's called pedagogic, pedagogy, pedagogic teaching. The word pedagogy simply means to lead the child. So most teaching assumes that an expert stands at the front of the room and leads the room towards the holy grail of knowledge, pedagogy, lead the child. And that's whether you are at nursery school, primary, secondary, college, university, whatever. Education is is built around a pedagogic model of learning. A key opposite of pedagogic learning is andragogic learning. And I operate at an extreme end of the andragogic learning philosophy. I'll explain how and why we do that. I'll start off by saying that we have 36 students and a thousand teachers, which in itself is quite weird, or we have no students and a thousand and thirty-six teachers, or we have a thousand and thirty-six teachers, or all of those uh, statements are true. I think all of those statements are true. There's a, an amazing book which I'm sure you've read, and I'm sure many of your listeners will have read called The Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell. And, and Gladwell talks about how ideas spread. And he talks about salespeople, connectors, and mavens in that book, you'll remember. And the word maven is an old Yiddish word, and it simply means expert. So the word maven means expert. And the truth is that we are all experts at things, different things. And the other truth is that we all have maven radars built into our brains so we can work out who in our network or our extended network is the expert to go to to solve a particular problem. So you may well be the expert that people go to to choose a lawnmower or to buy an ISA or to buy a secondhand car. And you may have people that you know in your network to go to when you want to solve a podcasting problem or do something on Adobe, or buy a mortgage, or whatever. Do you know what I mean? We've all got Maven radars. Yeah, yeah. The same is true in a classroom. The room very quickly works out who the experts are at different things in the room. And the some knowledge in the room is always going to be greater than the person standing at the front. So the students, as a cohort, as a body, are always going to have more wisdom, knowledge, than somebody who stands at the front and wants to chalk and talk. So once we understand the Maven radar that's built into all of us, we then need to create a learning environment that encourages Mavens to behave like Mavens and encourages our Maven radar to spot where those Mavens are. And so my job is I'm I'm, I'm sort of a cross between, well, I'm, I'm Willy Wonka and I'm a circus ringmaster. My job is to create a safe environment where people are are happy to go to each other or the guests that are coming into the school to seek the knowledge that they want to seek. I do that by writing a new play each year. Ah, okay. My curriculum is is constantly evolving, and my curriculum is constantly evolving through a, a wiki that the industry can contribute towards. And once a year, I pause the wiki and I turn it into educational language, what's called learning aims and outcomes, which I write at level six and level seven, but mainly at level six, which is a BA level. And from that, I write a play. And every year I write a brand new play. And the reason I write a play is partly uh, because it keeps me on my toes. It allows me to refresh each year, uh, debug, iterate, and create a better experience, but also story theory. We learn best when we, when we learn through story. And story affects the psychology of the room. Now, in storytelling, it's said that there are only seven ways to tell a story. Every story ever told fits into one of seven frameworks. Comedy, tragedy, hero's return, quest, for example. One is rags to riches. So whenever I write a play, I write it in the rags to riches framework. All, well, now 11 plays that I've written have been written in rags to riches framework. And I write it that way because my students arrive on day one in Primark and they will leave on day end in Prada. So there's a rags to riches story floating through. And the way that that story is expressed is through a sequence of briefs and stunts and experiences. So I'll read you the play that's happening this September. 
If you are a current student about to join me on September 10, turn off now because I like there to be a, a little bit of surprise. <laughs> but, <laughs> so the story of September 1920, intake 1920, is called Pump Up the Volume. The story uh, is inspired by success in our job comes from creating noise that gets people dancing to our tune. We should aspire to make work that our audiences want to turn on and turn up. We seek big ideas that can run and run for years and years, allowing future generations of creatives to produce new content that follows our format. And the word volume might mean a book forming part of a work or series, or the amount of space that a substance or object occupies, or quantity or power of sound. So that's become the theme of this year's story. How I translate that through stunts and exercises might be, for example, that students have to make a silent movie, or that there's one I'm really excited by. We give them five London football clubs. They look at one signing by each of those football clubs. They've got to write a football chant uh, for that new <laughs> signing. They've then got to seed it into a blog that belongs to that football club and then go into that club with a decibel noise reader and measure how loud their chant is in the grounds of that club. <laughs> so that's an example of me writing a play and then taking content in my curriculum to tell the story of that year. I'm just going to load up a different year's story. I'm going to load up Spark Eternal Folklore. Spark Eternal Folklore was the story of 1718. Folklore is the tradition, beliefs, customs and stories that a community passes through generations by word of mouth. The insight... Everybody wants to be remembered, spoken about years from now for the good things that we did by family. They may be, even be aspired to be remembered by strangers. And this is true of most people and most brands. Just swap families for fans and strangers for new customers. So you can see how each story, there's a tell or a purpose behind it. And then you can kind of imagine some of the games that I would have played in Spark Eternal, having heard of one or two of the games that I've played out in or written out in, uh, in Pump Up the Volume. What's interesting from a, a psychology point of view is the way that I write the story will affect the behaviour, the attitudes and the values of the room. So if I go wrong with a story, I can see why quite early on. And then I have to pedal back and rewrite quite a bit to change the, the behaviours, the output of the intake before the end of the year. Has that answered your question? I feel like I've, I've rambled on, but that will give you some, some ways in which we're a bit different. I think it's fantastic. That, that idea of uh, you know, writing a football chant and then getting people, influencing people in a way that they get to chant it, there will be nobody in the crowd who feels that they've been manipulated you know, so you've got to write a good, you, and you don't want that. You want them to write a good chant. You want your chant to have, to be real and have longevity. Um, yeah. And, and, and yeah, therefore it's well, not, therefore really it's, fun. yeah. So therefore it's not about conning people, is it? It's about actually doing, creating a piece of work, which is, uh, which is real and authentic and has value. Which great advertising should have. So I, I'm an Arsenal fan. Lately, we've not had much to chant about. And to be fair, we're not the most, we're not the most vocal of fans. Um, and whatever. But there are some great chants out there. He's short, he's quick, his name's a porno flick, Emmanuel. You know, <laughs> the, <laughs> there's some really good content out there. And I'm really excited to see what, what my room does with, for example, that brief. But that's, that's one of about 30 games that I've written for the students for term one. And they won't all be executed. I, not all 30 will play out. We'll, we'll cut and paste and, and chop and shop and whatever we need to do. But uh, yeah, I'm really excited to see what I'm really excited to see what they do with them. And what's your funding model? Do you, are you do you still get? You've got I think you said a third are scholarships and some get bursaries, and so the others are paying themselves, and you get funding from the industry, do you, to support the the scholarships? Yeah. So there are some agencies that gift us money, and for that we're very grateful. And for that they get a bunch of privileges. So agencies that sponsor the school allow us to change lives. And we work on a spirit of reciprocity. So everything that we do at school is built on our North Star being reciprocity. So an agency that supports the school will get first access to talent. So they get an early portfolio day, for example. 
they get the first right to get my, my students on, on a placement. All of my students, sign, whether they're scholarship or not, sign a contract that says that their first placements will be with sponsor agencies. Sponsors are allowed to set live briefs, depending on how much they sponsor, anything from one live brief a year to an unlimited number of, of briefs within reason. So sponsors get all sorts of benefits. And one of our revenue streams is sponsorship revenue. Another revenue stream is me teaching in other schools or teaching other schools how to teach. So for example, I helped uh, WPP School Shanghai set up its, its model of learning and I taught its equivalent of me how to sort of do some of the things that I do. Um, and I would go there two or three times a year to run workshops with the students, but also run workshops with the faculty. I got a similar relationship with uh, a French university group called INSEEK, where I take the best of their students and, and give them an SCA experience. And that's being expanded. So, for example, this year, I don't just have their creative students, but I've also got a week with 100 computer science engineers. So those sorts of opportunities also go into the scholarship pot where I go out and I do my sort of educational consultancy bit um, that helps fund scholarships. And then we get fee paying students. And that's great. It's hard because those students at the moment can't get finance because we're not a university. That might change in time. But for now, it is what it is. And then finally, we get live briefs from non-sponsors. So somebody will come along and say, look, will you do this for us? And, and here's a chunk of cash. And if we think it's a good learning opportunity for the room and it doesn't take us too far away from curriculum, then we may, we may do that. Well, and that's where you and I, Mark, first met a few years ago when Commerce Futures had your that year's cohort do a live brief for us as part of our conference with e-commerce directors. It was fantastic that the work that they were able to, the ideas they were able to generate in such a short space of time was mind-blowing. Cool, thank you. Yeah, those, those things are fun. And I remember at the time there was, you had a, uh, you had a fantastic showreel. One of them was the students had developed an advert for a scooter and the Metropolitan Police had said they weren't going to chase drug dealers on scooters. So there was this whole, <laughs> the Peugeot Ped, the number one scooter choice You've for drug dealers memory. in London. And it was just... You've got was, good memory. Now, that, that team are now a very, very famous creative team. That was done by um, Tom Bender. Tom, Tom Bender, Tom Corcoran are one of the most famous creative teams in the UK now. They're at Wyden and Kennedy. You might have recently seen their Phones Are Good TV commercial, which is proper fun. If you haven't seen it, Google it. Or you might have seen their Nike Londoner commercial. Both were, were amongst the most awarded films of the last 12 months. An amazing team. And so you got to see, you got to see them just before they, they kind of found their stride. But if you go now and look at, at Nike Londoner or go and look at Phones Are Good, I'm certain you'll see their voice from that Peugeot moped commercial in Nike London or in Phones Are Good. Okay, that's great. I'm glad that, because that the original one they did, that really tickled me at the time, poking fun at Peugeot and the police at the same time. Look, we're, we are almost out of time, Mark. You've been very generous today. Uh, one of the things I ask everybody I get on is, what is it that you know now, not with a sense of regret, but what, what is it you know now? If you went back in time, you do something maybe faster, better, differently. Give up drugs sooner. <laughs> okay. I mean it. Um, I, I smoked a lot of dope. And, and I stood by this belief that, that smoking weed contributes towards creativity. And it's bullshit. What contributes towards creativity is collecting dots, uh, going out there and seeing the world, asking the right sorts of questions, and being prepared to fail. There's a, a myth that you need to have a, a joint in your mouth to be creative. And I bought that myth for, for far too long. I feel so much healthier for not, for not smoking. I probably saved a lot of money for not smoking. I hope I'm a slightly better role model for not smoking. And so to answer your question, yeah, if I could have stopped in my, in my teens or 20s or better still, never have started, that would be one of the things that, that I might have done differently, stop, stop earlier. And then the other thing I ask is, are there any books that 
have changed your life or had a big influence on you or maybe you've gifted to other people? Oh, that's an easy question to answer. Future Shock by Alvin Toffler. The the story there is is I won my scholarship at the SCA. I was 2021. 20, I had three uh, CSEs. I got U's in English and maths. I was an idiot in secondary education. I didn't take it seriously at all. I was at the SCA to be a copywriter. John realised very quickly that I wasn't going to be a good copywriter because I didn't really have a good grasp of of English because I'd never read a book in my life. At the age of 20, 21, I just had not read. And John gave me Future Shock by Toffler on day two. And, you know, my, I, t- I said earlier in this podcast that my wife's family had a farm and we used to do this thing every every April uh, lambing season where we would go into the fields and help Uncle John take a baby lamb that was minutes old uh, and carry it to the farmhouse uh, and into the kitchen towards the arger and lay it just outside the arger, the, the oven, where it's nice and warm. And, and after an hour or so, the baby lamb would open its eyes and the first thing it would see would be a golden Labrador. And for the rest of its life, that baby lamb would believe itself to be a pet dog in the farmhouse, you know, and it would dress up in a diaper and all the rest of it because you can't house train a lamb. And why I'm saying that is because the first thing that you see when you are born casts a long shadow. It informs who you are. And I was born on day two at the SCA. The first book that I read was Toffler's Future Shock. The opening paragraphs of uh, Future Shock, Toffler says that everything from the smallest bacteria to the largest galaxy, everything is a process and all processes evolve and they're all evolving faster and faster and faster. And so Toffler creates this idea that we now take for granted called exponential speed of change that later becomes things like Moore's law and stuff like this. If you think back to some of the questions I've answered you in this podcast, so for example, how I write my my learning experience, that my curriculum is evolving all the time, for example, the speed of change gets faster. Everything that I've done from day two at SCA to a minute ago and for the rest of my life will be recognising that everything is a process, that everything can be broken down into component parts and put back together in more effective ways. And our job as, as creative executors is to explore why things are not working or how things can work more efficiently and do our very best uh, to make things faster, stronger, richer, for better experiences, for better society, for better lives. Mark, that's fantastic. Are there any other books? Obviously, you haven't had as big an impact, but you think... Well, I mean, that that's my Bible, right? So that that is... That's my Old New Testament, my, my Quran. I mean it as much as that. It is my faith. I, my faith is, I believe very strongly in the human's power to evolve the world around him or her. That our job is to uh, slowly walk out of the cave and with every step make the planet around us significantly better for the generations that will come after us. Often we don't do that well. Often we abuse our environment and leave it in a worse place for the people around us. But when done with responsibility, our job is to evolve things to make the world a safer, more secure environment for the generation that comes next. So Future Shock is my Bible. Other books I've loved, whether they're relevant for your for your audience, I just don't know. My favourite books are on advertising, for what it's worth. My very favourite book is Made to Stick by Dan and Chip Heath, the brothers. A beautiful book. My my favourite story from the world of advertising is the story of Howard Luck Gossage by Steve Harrison. Uh, I just think it's a beautiful story, very well told by an incredible writer about an incredible writer. So if you are a geek of advertising... Steve Harrison's book on Gossage is going to be one of those summer reads that you're just going to, it's just going to warm your heart. What else have I read that I've absolutely loved? Well, I helped a a girl a couple of seasons, a couple of intakes ago, get over her own addiction to drugs. And so we read Johan Hara's book on drugs together. The um, I want to say it's called Scream. Anybody that's dealing with addiction, Johan Hara's books on depression, 
and his books on addiction are uh, superb books to read if that's if that's something that's affecting you or people in your family or people in your workplace that'll do wouldn't it yeah absolutely brilliant over delivered again <laughs> Mark, that was absolutely sensational. Thank you very much indeed for giving me your time today. That's a pleasure. It was great speaking to you again. All this information and more can be found at dominicmonkhouse.com forward slash podcast. There you'll find show notes, additional reading and links related to this episode. You can also find my blog and the past editions of the Melting Pot newsletter. The simplest thing to do is to sign up to my subjectively, not crap, once a week newsletter, where I'll update you on what I've been up to, the most interesting articles I've read, and all things relating to scaling up, high-performing teams, net promoter score, company culture, etc. Social, you can find me on Twitter at Dom Monkhouse and LinkedIn at Dominic Monkhouse. LinkedIn is probably the best way to reach me and share your questions and comments. Thanks for listening.